that day to rise, aren't you? It could be any moment. It could be any day. At any time. So we need to be ready. And I ask you this morning, are you ready? And sometimes we feel like ready or not. Here I come. And uh, you got to be ready. Turn with me this morning, Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Please uh, continue to pray for Pastor Jay and Ms. Roxanne's are away on the uh, marriage retreat. Many folks uh, are with them. And praise the Lord for what's going on there. Many good reports of what the Lord is doing. And thank the Lord. Pray for their safety as they all travel back. And uh, let's keep them in our prayers today. Matthew 21. And obviously today is Palm Sunday. And everybody bring your palms. <laughs> Wrong ones, I guess. <laughs> Matthew 21, we'll read the first 11 verses. When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to uh, Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go over into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and He will send them immediately. And all this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and sitting on a donkey and a colt and the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their garments on them, and He sat on them. A very large crowd spread their garments on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went before him and that followed him cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the entire city was moved, saying, Who is he? And the crowd said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. What, a, what an occasion to be a part of, right? I mean, could you uh, imagine sometimes we need to put ourselves in the story, but could you imagine being a part of that crowd that day? Being able to sing Hosanna and cry out Hosanna and shout Hosanna to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, what a great occasion. But we pick up today a few events that have taken place just to get us up to date. Uh, recent events that have happened in our, in our passage, in around our passage. The blind men have been healed. Zacchaeus has been saved. Uh, the blind men near Jericho have been healed. They, they journey toward Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus is in Bethany. Mary anoints his feet. The crowds come to Jesus and to Lazarus. I mean, what a great uh, uh, occasions have been happening. We have reached this pivotal point in the life of Jesus. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem, and Jesus had been there many times. In fact, he had been in those cities below many times, and now he descends from the Mount of Olives on this day, and he'll be setting in motion the certain events that will climax with his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And what we'll celebrate next week on Easter Sunday. Can I get an amen? amen. The events we're studying today uh, took place sometimes. Some people believe on Sunday, some people believe it was on a Monday. But before the sun sets on this coming Friday, Jesus would have been crucified and buried. And before the sun rises on the next Sunday, Jesus will have conquered death, hell, and the grave and resurrected from the dead. Amen. That's exciting, isn't it? Uh, in his book, The Angels Were Silent, Max Lucado writes this, Forget any suggestion that Jesus was trapped. Erase any theory that Jesus made, uh, mis uh, made, uh, made a miscalculation. Ignore any speculation that the cross was the last-ditch attempt to salvage a dying mission. For if these words uh, tell us anything, they tell us that Jesus died on purpose. No surprise, no hesitation, no faltering. No, the journey to Jerusalem didn't begin in Jericho. It didn't begin in Galilee. It didn't even begin in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before as the echo of the crunching of the fruit was still sounding in the garden. Jesus was leaving for Calvary. Amen. The triumph of entry is the only second incident, I believe, maybe studying out, maybe there's a few others that in Jesus' ministry that all four writers recorded. The other being the, the feeding of the 5,000. 
So Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem is a critical act, a critical point in the final drama. And no surprise that these, these uh, all four wanted to record these happenings. And today we're looking at the, the event, a big day in the life of a little mule. A big day in the life of a little mule. First of all, I want to see our, the obedience of the disciples. Look here in verses 1 through 6, the obedience of the disciples. When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethany and Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go over into the village. Opposite you, immediately you will find a donkey tied, a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And you'll send them immediately. And all this was done fulfilled. Oh, it's spoken by the prophet in verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had commanded them. Wow, what a statement. Jesus makes a command and the disciples simply understood the command and went and did what they were supposed to do. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be amazing as, uh, uh, as, uh, us, as parents? Wouldn't that be awesome? You just give a command and simple obedience follows that command. We would all shout Hosanna on that day. Amen? <laughs> that was a joke. You can laugh. That's okay. <laughs> First of all, I want you to see their expectation. He said in verse 2, you go over to the village opposite you, next to you, and immediately you, you will find a donkey tied, and I want you to go and, 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 and untie them and bring them to me. Their expectation is what they're going to find. What are you going to find? You're going to find a colt. You're going to find a colt tied. You're going to find a colt that's never been sat on, never been ridden. And keep in mind, it wasn't just a normal audience in Jerusalem. The Passover was about to happen, and historians tell us that the population of Jerusalem at that time was around 80,000. And during the Passover, between 2 and 3 million would crowd into that city for the celebration. Think about that. For going from 80,000 to 2 to 3 million, the swell of that city. And so these disciples were supposed to go over into the city next to them and walk in there and just find a particular donkey that has been tied. You ever get some instructions and say, are you sure? I mean, any more, uh, you got any more detail about this? I mean, it was pretty, pretty detailed command. You're going to find a donkey and it's tied and it's going to have a mother there. Why don't you bring both of them to me? But it needed a little bit more. I mean, could you tell me what street corner it's on? Can you, can you give me the specific GPS coordinates, please? I need a little bit of help here. But he said, no, I want you to go over there and you're going to find a donkey tied. What, that's what their expectation was, to find exactly what Jesus had described to them. And I guarantee you that the command that Jesus gives us will find exactly as He says it is. It reminds me of the shepherds when they were told in, in, in the, out in the fields of finding the sheep uh, by night and the angels came to them and said, Hey, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And they said, man, we've got to go see what's happening here. And they went and found it just as it had been told them. Wow, it happens every time, amen? amen? And sometimes, let's face it, sometimes our expectations aren't met and we get out of joint. Amen? Sometimes if we, if we don't see it as we ought to think we see it, and it doesn't happen the way we ought to think it ought to happen, oh, I can't believe it. Reminds me of John chapter 11. Had a couple of sisters and a brother. Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They send word for Jesus. Jesus come, your, your, your buddy, your friend, your, your close confidant, Lazarus is sick and he's going to die. And Jesus just hangs out. Jesus just takes his time and says, you know what, I'm going to show up when it's time to show up. And you'll know it when it's time. He tells the disciples, we're going to go see Lazarus. He's sick and about to die. Matter of fact, he's already dead. What? And Jesus shows up. And Martha runs out to meet him. And said, Jesus, if you'd have been here, if you'd have met my expectation, if you'd have done the things that I think you ought to have done, this would have never happened. If we were honest, we would probably feel like that sometimes with Jesus. And Jesus, if you'd have, if you'd have run the thing by my playbook... Man, I have the best plans available. Man, you look at you look at my plans, and man, you can't beat these. But yet she said, "But even now, 
in my hurt, but even now in my disappointment, but even now in my confusion, she says, but now, but even now, I know. What about you and I? Sometimes our expectations don't go and we get out of joint. We don't understand. Can we say as Martha did, but even now, I know. But even now, I don't understand this command, Lord. But even now, I don't understand all the details of what you're doing and what you're going to do. But I'm going to simply obey and, and, and walk in obedience doing the things I know you've asked me to do. Their obedience was immediate. The Bible tells us in verse 6 the disciples went. They didn't say the disciples held a prayer meeting and see if that's really what the Lord wanted them to do. The Bible doesn't say the disciples huddled up and see if they had any better plans. The disciples didn't huddle up and say, you know what, what else can we do? What else uh, other, other options are available? Can we just go rent a donkey? That was kind of humorous. I don't want to take that by storm. But can, can we go to the Hertz rental and, and rent, a, rent a donkey and bring it back? I mean, do we have to exactly follow Jesus' commands exactly like He tells us to? But their obedience was immediate. Their obedience was simple. They just went and did. They just simply followed the Word of the Lord as He had told them. And guess what? It happened exactly as He told them. That's simple, isn't it? Isn't that the Christian life, though? It is, it is simply this. You, you, you read the Word and you love the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Love God and love others. But sometimes we, 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 we complicate and, and, uh, the, the simplicity uh, of loving God and loving others the way we ought to. It was immediate. It was just simple obedience and their obedience led to greater obedience. Did y'all notice that? They went and followed the Lord's command and, and later on the Lord said, hey, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes. <laughs> until you're endued with power. I want you to tarry. I want you to sit still and, and, and wait and, and hold a prayer meeting. <laughs> So the simple obedience of following and going and finding a donkey led to greater obedience later on. And guess what? That'll happen to you and I. We, we follow the Lord's commands today. Guess what we'll find ourselves tomorrow? Finding ourselves and following the Lord's commands tomorrow. Yeah. It's simple. It's immediate. It's greater obedience. Not, all, not only obedience, I see an offering here. Don't get nervous. <laughs> and we, you know, I like to spread a little humor out in, in the sermon. I, to, I should have said that from the very beginning. Sometimes I spread humor out during the sermon, and it's okay to laugh a little bit, okay? <laughs> the offering. It says the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. Verse number 7, they brought the donkey and the colt laid their garments on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their garments on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went, and they began to cry, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Man, can, can you imagine this, this offering that, that people were, were doing? They brought the donkey. They, they laid their coats. They laid their outer garments on them. They laid their outer garments on the road. They began to cut down branches. I mean, people began to get excited about worshiping Jesus. Could you imagine? <laughs> A people that were throwing and placing their clothes on the donkey on the road and they were cutting down limbs and waving and crying and singing. There was usually something exciting happening around Jesus. You know, if you wanted to be anywhere during the biblical times, it usually was around Jesus because something exciting, something great, something unusual was going to happen. And that gets me excited. When Jesus shows up, that ought to get some excited, some little, woo, you know, a little bit in your tank there a little bit. Okay. When Jesus showed up, something good was about to happen. And I feel like something good is about to happen. There was excitement. I love excitement. It's 
It's better than falling asleep, amen? <laughs> Not only their excitement, I see they're exalting here in verse number 10. Verse 9 and 10, they, they began to cry out. They began to sing and praise God. Isn't it good just to praise God? Isn't it, isn't it good to praise God excitedly? <laughs> I love getting around people who are excited and not ashamed to praise the Lord. Amen. I remember we had a missionary, uh, still do, missionary friend, and uh, he, he spent years in New Guinea, years in Fiji, and you, you never knew what he was going to do in church or in public. He was just really crazy. And I guess if you're going to be a missionary, you've got to be a little crazy. <laughs> he, uh, he came into town and was going to be at the church and was going to preach and present. And I told my, my parents were over here, I told my parents, do not bring him. And, and I, was, I was working at Burger King over here on 460. I said, please do not bring him by the store. Please, because he was like one of te he's teasing me that he's gonna come by and embarrass me. He said, "Please don't, please, please don't bring him by, because you never know what he's gonna do." I mean, he, I remember one time we was in an auditorium at this singing, and we were up in the balcony. He saw somebody he knew down there, but you know you can't say hey. So he started uh, squealing like a pig. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But it brought a lot of excitement. <laughs> These people had excitement, but they were excited about praising God. It, it, was a, it was a prophecy coming to pass in Zechariah 9.9. 9. It tells us this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Zechariah 9.9 9 is being fulfilled before their very eyes, and they are participating in this. They were exalting the lowly one. As I just mentioned in Zechariah 9.9, 9, it talks about uh, uh, the Messiah riding in lowly on the, on the colt, on the foal of a donkey. And that's what we see happening here. Imagine the procession Jesus is on a donkey. And He's surrounded by the throngs of common people. One writer says this, it was a procession of paupers. The people were waving palm branches, not swords. They were... So he was sitting on, on old, old coats, not a saddle. He was riding a little donkey, not a mighty stallion. He's surrounded by a ragtag sort of group and not a strong group of soldiers. The Roman soldiers who saw this parade probably laughed and said, Ha! The king of the Jews riding on a, on a little donkey. Can you imagine? I want you to look again at this crowd. Now, I'm about to enter the, the realm of uh, sanctified imagination, so y'all enter with me. Look again at this crowd. Who, who was there in this crowd? Who was waving palm branches? Who was shouting Hosanna? Who was laying their clothes in the road? I could imagine blind Bartimaeus, can't you? Can't you imagine blind Bartimaeus sitting there who, who once was blind, but now he can see that. Woo, I know this is the king. I know this is Jesus. I, I, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to throw out my coat for King Jesus as he's walking, as he's riding through on the donkey. I could imagine old Zacchaeus was there. He finally got out of that little tree and went home with Jesus, and his life was forever changed. How many lives have been forever changed? Okay, we need a little bit more gas in the tank this morning. <laughs> Could you imagine blind Bartimaeus? Could you imagine uh, Zacchaeus being there? Could you imagine Lazarus who was once dead in the grave for four days and he must have been a teenager because his parents said, Woo, he stinks, amen. <laughs> and, and Mary and Martha were there saying, This is the king. This is the king of the Jews. This is my savior. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah. And they were waving palm branches. They were singing Hosanna. They were throwing clothes in the road. Could you... Imagine that with me this morning. This was excited. They were exalting the lowly one. That crowd was full of people who Jesus had healed, who Jesus had delivered, who Jesus had ministered to. They were praising Him. And I'm in that parade too. Are you? It's a, mighty, it's a mighty long parade by now, but it's marching off toward eternity with Jesus in the lead to those who, 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 who know Him or are praising Him and worshiping Him who became poor that we might become rich in Him. He was not only the lowly one, He was the lofty one. Mm -hmm. As the crowd descended the slopes of the Mount of Olives, the people were praising the Lord. And they were practicing this 
antiphonal singing. You, you didn't know I knew a big word, but that's kind of a big word. I googled it and found out what it meant. <laughs> it means that the folks in the front were saying one thing and the folks in the back were answering. It's kind of like we used to say, the front of the bus, the front of the bus, who's in the front of the bus? The back of the bus, the back of the bus. You know, it just drives you crazy. <laughs> that's what that type of singing is if you, if you don't know what antiphonal is. It's in the common knowledge there. I just want to throw that out. And the people in the front would say something and the people in the back were answering them. And the word was Hosanna. It means save now. It was a cry for the Messiah to deliver His people. It had come to be used as a shout of praise, much like hallelujah. And it's alright to say hallelujah. The people were praising the name of the King. Just as the book of Psalms says in chapter 118, verse 25 through 26. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Yes. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee. Send now prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The people are exalting Jesus as their king. And right, rightly so. Mark doesn't get in a, a whole lot of this, but Luke does. Luke tells us that the Pharisees got upset. Can you imagine? People getting upset about excitement and praise. Not in the church. I wouldn't imagine that to ever happen in the church. To ever think that somebody would get upset about somebody else praising the Lord. That's humorous too, okay? <laughs> Can you imagine? Look over there. Can you imagine? Oh, have you ever? My goodness. <laughs> We're not going to go there very long. We'll keep going. <laughs> they want Jesus to tell the followers to stop shouting. Calm down. Jesus, calm your followers down. They're, they're just getting out of hand. And would to God somebody think we was getting out of hand. <laughs> we so far off, we don't well, never mind. Jesus tells us that if these people were to hold their praise, their, their, their peace, that the very rocks would cry out. And the prophecy is being fulfilled. The Lord says, hey, I'm going to get my praise one way or another. It's going to be these people or these rocks. And let me just say that as long as the Lord saves sinners and leaves them here on earth, there will be a people, a group of people, a person somewhere who is giving praise to the worthy one of all time. Amen. We are commanded to praise Him. We have every reason to praise Him. Amen. And I don't want the rocks to do something I am capable of doing myself. I remember uh, I was in a service in the in the uh, it was a, to a group of pastors and and he gave an invitation and we came down we're praying and, and seeking the Lord and and he, and he begins to say all right now and he was singing along there all right let's just whoever's here let's just start praising the Lord and people started clapping and there's nothing wrong with clapping amen I mean this is a natural thing to do hand left hand right hand left hand right hand left hand you know there's nothing wrong with that but. He said, no, I don't want you to just clap. I want you to praise the Lord with your lips. But a lot, a lot of times, let's, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And that's okay. But how about let's give a, the Lord some praise from our lips. And I began to dawn on me, yeah, you know, when we want to praise the Lord, it's, you know, all right, let's give the Lord a big hand, you know. Like He deserves a hand. He deserves more than just a big round of applause. Amen. He deserves the praise of our lips. There's, a, there's another character in this story I want to call our attention to. This character is often overlooked. And rightly so. And Jesus called for a colt and a donkey. Why didn't He just walk in? At the time of His arrival, Jesus going through the gates into the city, He was going through the sheep gate. So at the same time Jesus was going in, there was all these sheep going in too. The Lamb of God that was going to take away the sin of the world was going through the same gate as the offerings that were going to be sacrificed. Can you imagine that? So why couldn't Jesus just walk in with them? Or, or, or why couldn't Jesus be carried in on the shoulders of His disciples? Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! You know, thinking about that. Or why, why couldn't Jesus be flown in on the wings of angels? He deserved, really deserved that as well. But he chose to use the most lowly of animals, the donkey. I want to notice several things about this donkey. 
And I hope you can relate to these. Reminds me of uh, the Three Stooges ordering the court. <laughs> where, where, where the lawyer says, it would take the strength of a mule to pull this trigger. And he thought he was talking to Curly over there. I know you. And uh, <laughs> Mo says, no, you is too short. <laughs> <laughs> that was free. I'll, I'll take care of that. <laughs> I want you to look at several things about this donkey. But first of all, the donkey had to be redeemed. <clears throat> According to the Word of God, that donkey was, the, was only alive and available for the Lord to use because it had been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Exodus 13 tells us in verse 13 and Exodus 34, verse number 20, that, 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 that the firstborn uh, of... Uh, of that, of that uh, donkey had to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And the same could be said of us today. In our natural state, the Bible tells us that we are dead in trespasses and sin. In our natural state, we are enemies of God. In our natural state, we are given over to the lust of the flesh. In our natural state, we are under the condemnation of God. In our natural state, we are fit only for destruction and hell. In our natural state, we are useless to God, separated Him by our sin. Isaiah 59, verse number 2. That was our natural state. And that might be how the Lord found us. This is an amen alert. Amen alert. That might be how the Lord has found us, but that's not the way He has left us. Amen. He has saved us by His grace and changed us completely. He has given us life. Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. But not just life. He has given us everlasting life. He has given us new life. He has given us the heavenly life. He has given us the abundant life. And He has delivered us from the penalty of our sins. He has bridged the gulf that was between us and Him. Amen. And this is the only reason you and I have become useless to the Lord today. Praise God for His redeeming power in the blood of Jesus. So just so we understand, redemption is not an option, by the way. It's not an option. It's not optional. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Without the new birth, we are lost in our sin. Without the new birth, we have no hope. We are separated from God. And you'll notice that the Lord didn't say, Nicodemus, you must be baptized again. Nicodemus, you must join the church again. You must turn over a new leaf again. You must do a lot of good things again. The Lord told Nicodemus that he needed new life and it was only through the new birth. And the Bible says, he didn't say, you must be born again and again and again. He said, you just must be born again. The redemption is not something that happens because we did join a church or we were baptized or anything of good of ourselves. Salvation comes when a lost sinner is convicted of sin. And looks by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. Amen. It's an encounter with the grace of God. Totally connected, unconnected from any works of the flesh. Have you been redeemed this morning? You and I will be useful to the Lord when we have been redeemed by His blood. The donkey was redeemed. The donkey had to be released. The Bible says that they were to go find the donkey that had been tied. When Jesus told his disciples about this little donkey, he put this little detail in there. They were to untie the donkey and bring it to Jesus. That little donkey was bound and needed to be set free before the Lord could use it. Wonder how that donkey felt being all tied up. Next to his mom, too. How uncool. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> my, my mom's right over here, and when I was a young, when I was a young stallion, I mean donkey. <laughs> you know, you didn't want to be seen as uncool. And here's this little young colt tied, tied up, and next to his mom of all things. No doubt there were other animals that were loose in the city. I wonder if he was tied there wondering, why can't I be loose like all the other animals? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? I mean, can you use your sanctified imagination this morning? I mean, don't let it go. Use it a little bit. I mean, could you imagine the donkey that was tied up wanting to be loose like all the other people? Maybe some of the other animals. But no, he had to be tied up next to his mom. 
And maybe what he didn't understand was his owner was putting him in the prime place to be used by God. I'm, it's getting good. I'm enjoying this. I'm going to step out a little deeper. I mean, could you imagine? Now I can't imagine because I, I'm a parent. I couldn't imagine when I was just 15, 16, 13, 14 at home and you can't do this, you can't go here, you, you, no, we're not doing that. And here's the proverbial question, but why? Because one day, the Lord's going to have need of you. One day, Jesus is going to send for you. And if you're not tied up, where are you supposed to be tied up at? And you out lose, run with all the other animals. Kicking and screaming and he hawing That just came to him. That's kind of funny. And you're not where you're supposed to be. You might miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime to carry Jesus in the gates to behold what the people are praising Jesus about. Now I understand that we are, as a parent, you, you try to do your best and, 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 and raise your children, but you, you, you desire to put them in a position, into a place where when Jesus has need of them and Jesus calls for them, they're at the right place, they're tied up, they yep, I'm going to go because Jesus has called me. That's what we can ask for. That's all we can ask for. That's all we can do. Is put them in, in, in pray and put them in positions where Jesus will want to use them and can use them. No doubt that owner had expectations for that donkey. He had set the sacrifice for that donkey. He had, he, he had, he had an idea for what that donkey was going to do. But neither the owner nor the mama donkey could imagine the great purpose God had for that little donkey. I'm talking about a big day in a little mule's life. When Jesus says, hey... I want you. When Jesus said, you know, disciples, I, I got somebody particular, special in mind. Oh, yeah? Is, is it the best guy in, 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 in all of Jerusalem? Is it the most beautiful sky in the vault? Nope. It's the choicest of breeze? Nope. It's a common lowly animal. <laughs> that just includes me, amen. Yeah. It's more than just being in the right place at the right time. It's being content with being tied to the post of consecration. If you're young, you may not understand it now. But one day you will. One day you'll stop kicking against the post of consecration. I don't understand. I, I can't do this. And you, you start brain jerking back and I don't like it. One day you will. And I guarantee you the mother of loose animals up there he hauling around, they, they'd rather be tied up being used to God and be up there wild and have nothing to show. Or some may have been content to be tied to the post of compromise. Some are now tied to the post of condemnation. But I'm glad now there is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. When Jesus found us, we were just like that little donkey. <laughs> Before you and I could be of any use to Him, the chains of sin must be broken. We must be set free. And I don't know you know it or not. But we are born into this world slaves to sin. We are children of the devil and, it, and we're doing His will, His bidding. In that condition, we are useless to the Lord. We can't serve Him. We can't live for Him. We can't bring Him glory to His name. We are useless in that bound up, tied down situation. And we need to be set free. And I praise His name that we have been set free. And that's what He does for His children. 
He comes to where we are. He gives us the liberty. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. liberty. There is freedom. There is ability to walk about in, in the glorious freedom in Christ Jesus. Who the Son sets free, He is free indeed. He delivers us from the bondage of sin. He gives us a new desire to follow Him and to serve Him. He makes us a new creation. He moves in and takes up residence in our bodies. He gives us the freedom from sin and self and Satan, all these things. And I wonder, have you ever been released from those things? If we have, we need to give praise in the house. Amen. Amen. I believe when Jesus was done with that donkey, He returned it to the owners. When that donkey came back to the owner, it was better than when he left. Can you imagine? That donkey was tied up. No one had ever sat on that donkey. That donkey was unbroken. And yet when it came back, he came home. It was ready for the Sabbath. It was ready for the, for the work. It was ready for the steady, steadiness of every day. And that's just what the Lord does. Amen? He takes what we give Him. And he, when He gives it back, it's far better than what it was when He got it. You give Him an Abram, you, you, you give him an Abram, a lost pagan, you'll get back an Abraham, a mighty man of faith. You give Him a Jacob, a, a trickster, a schemester, and you'll, give, you'll get back an Israel, a prince of God. You give Him your Saul of Tarsus, a mean and cruel man, and you'll get back a Paul, a mighty apostle of God. You give Him a Simon, a weak, a vacillating man who can't hardly stand on his own two feet without putting them in his mouth. And you'll get back a Peter, a rock of Jesus. You give Him a broken, sin-scarred life, and He'll give you back a new start, a new life, and a home in heaven. You can't beat that deal at Walmart. Amen. Amen. That donkey had to be redeemed. It had to be set free. It had to be loosed. But that donkey had to be ruled. Someone had to take charge over that donkey. Verse 2 tells that donkey had never been set on. Never been ridden. It was a wild animal. That little wild donkey needed a master. It was wild, yet it submitted himself to the Lord Jesus. Yielded to his control. That donkey wasn't frightened when the crowds began to praise and make noise. It simply surrendered itself to the Lord totally. And the very fact that this little donkey had never been broken and Jesus was riding on it was a miracle in and of itself. That's exactly what He expects of us. He is looking for total submission, total surrender for our lives. Amen. Let's face the truth. Some people have a real problem with authority. Amen. Have a hard time with the idea of someone having authority over them. Whether it's parents or boss or whoever. Have a hard time with authority. And the fact is, there's always someone over us. Ultimately, our first and final authority is the Lord Jesus Christ. When He has redeemed us from our sins, He purchased us in, unto Himself. He owns us completely. We are submitted to His Lordship in our lives. We will have no trouble submitting in those areas of our life. Who's our master today? Who's the Lord of our life? If we're saved, He owns us completely. We don't have a right to use our any part of our life, any part of our being for ourselves. All must be done for the glory and honor of God. One of the most amazing statements in all the Bible happens right here. When it says, if anybody asks, if anybody asks what you're doing, if anybody says anything to you, the Bible says, verse number 3, I want you to say this. The Lord has need of me. I want you to take just a second and think about that statement. The Lord has need of them. When did God ever need anything? Here's what God said in Psalm 50, verse 9 through 12. I will not take a bull from your house, nor ghosts out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine in all its fullness. 
And yet the Bible says here that the Lord has need of them. Think about the paradox of the Lord's earthly life. He was rich, yet He became poor. He owned all things, yet He possessed nothing. He created the stars, but had nowhere to lay His head. He fashioned everything out of nothing, yet had to borrow a boat to preach the gospel. He created every drop of water, but yet He cried, I thirst, as He was dying on the cross. He created every rock, but He had to borrow a tomb to be laid in. He used a cloud as His chariot, yet He had to borrow a donkey in which to ride. He was rich, yet made himself poor, so that those who believe on him might enjoy his riches. The Lord could save sinners and accomplish so much work on earth without us and be just fine. Yet he chooses frail human instruments for his glory. When we're like that donkey who's been redeemed and been released and been ruled, he can use us too. Amen. The last of this morning, we'll you see the opportunity. Because of who the donkey was, because of who Jesus is, because of all that, what a great opportunity was given. Being a little donkey isn't so bad. Trust me. <laughs> Look at what the donkey did. He got, he got to carry in the king of glory into Jerusalem. The Lord used him as a vehicle to get glory to His name. And that's what He wants to do with you and me. Let's yield to Him. Let's let Him rule as He sees fit. By the way, when a little redeemed, released, ruled donkey walked with Jesus on His back, nobody saw the donkey. Nobody said, Hosanna, and look at the donkey. <laughs> Isn't He cute? Aww. Look at his floppy ears. No one said that. And today and the rest of our days, it's all about carrying Jesus. No matter what the crowds are shouting, because there's another crowd in a few days that will crowd, cry out and shout, crucify him. That day was a big day for that little mule, only because of the opportunity to carry Jesus for others to see. And our big day is literally every day. And every opportunity to share and carry Jesus. Amen. That was a big day in a little mule's life. Has it been a big day in your life? Where we, we may not look like much, and we might not be anybody else's first pick, but we're Jesus. Amen. Jesus picked us. He said, I, I want you. And I'm going to use you for my glory. And I'm going to ride in. And nobody's going to pay attention to you. They should be paying attention to me. And that's okay. Because I created you for this moment. And this time. And I'm going to use you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we, we may not understand the full picture, the full idea of what you have for our life. Sometimes it seems so unfair. Sometimes so unorthodox of what everybody else is doing, participating in. God, I, I pray that you help us to see that you have a purpose, a special plan for us to be a part of your story. To carry your gospel. To carry King Jesus to those that are around us. Not that people can pay attention to us. They can pay attention to see you. That they may see your good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Lord, there might be some here this morning that have never been redeemed. Never been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Never put their faith and trust in you. I pray, God, today that we see the simplicity of salvation. Simply turning from their sin to you. By 
faith calling out to you. Crying out to you. For their need. Might be some here that have never been ruled. They, they don't understand about submitting and surrendering their life. And maybe they want to do that afresh and anew today. There may be people who have been saved many years. And yet they want to continue to be used by you. Lord, use this invitation. Draw us close to you this morning. With our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, this invitation is for all of us, young and old. The Lord calling you to Himself. You want to submit and surrender anew. This is our time. The piano's playing softly. It's your time to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's calling out to you just like He did that little donkey. Are you available? Have you been redeemed? Have you been released? Are you being ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? Stand our feet this morning. Thank you again for this time.